John Byrne with Poets and Quants. You're here for our center court session on the University of South Carolina's Darla Moore School of Business. Now, let me just tell you that uh, the Moore School of Business has been a pioneer in international business. Uh, early on, when most U.S. schools paid no attention to the fact that there was a world out there uh, to study and learn from, uh, the Moore School uh, understood that business was a global affair and really organized itself around teaching people uh, how to prepare for careers in a new global world. And with us today to talk about the program and how it's evolved is Jennifer Min, who's the Managing Director of Full-Time MBA Programs. Uh, Jennifer is a longtime veteran of the admissions field, having started in law at Syracuse University uh, back when she was a baby. <laughs> that was 1997. Um, and for eight and a half years, she had been director of recruitment and uh, enrollment at Moore. And for the past four years, uh, she's been managing director of the full-time MBA programs. And we also have with us Doug Hanslip, who is with the Graduate Career Services Office and is in charge of employer relations. Welcome. Thanks for having us. Thank you. So Jennifer, I know you have two degrees. Mm -hmm. One is called a MIM, and let's explain what that is. It's a Master's in International Business. It's a one-year program, 10 academic courses, and three um, specializations that you could uh, take, including international finance, global strategy, and international market development. And then you have uh, an international uh, MBA, which is a 22-month program with two different tracks, and we'll get into the, the differences here. Um, from your perspective, maybe we go back a little bit on the history of the school to, to help people get some context about uh, the school's mission, its values, its reputation. Uh, how, did it, how was it that, in fact, the school became so focused on international business from the very beginning? Yeah, thanks, John. And I think you said it really well. Um, back when the, the founding administrators, the dean and faculty, saw this need to really deliver a program that companies could hire talent that could take the business ideas globally focused anywhere in the world and in particular be able to speak the language and understand the cultural context as well. Mm -hmm. um, we, we still say to today, today to all the students coming in that, you know, yes, the world has changed drastically. Every MBA and business program is global now. But the context that we keep in the program of wherever you're sitting making a decision, if you don't first stop and think about the immediate impact all the way down to sourcing the raw material of a remote village where that product is going to eventually come off the line at Coca-Cola, um, you are not doing your job as a business leader. And so that's infused into every part of our training in our program. We're fortunate in the Southeast, we have access to so many top companies, in particular the Port of Charleston and major even luxury brands automotive that have, have settled here. So the mission continues to grow essentially because of the partners and also industry that's come to South Carolina. Right. Now I'm assuming, and I may be wrong on this, that the Masters in International Business is more of a pre-experience uh, uh, master's program and your international MBA is more in the tradition of, you need to really have two or more years of work experience to come and fully appreciate the program and contribute in the classroom. Is that, is that right or no? <laughs> that is, and there's also some nuances with that pre-professional, to your point, those students haven't had that experience in a PL role or even understanding their, their manager having that responsibility. Um, and it, it also is the, the MIB program set up for those that may not be going into core business functions. So they're not focusing on a traditional MBA, marketing, finance, um, strategy, et cetera, supply chain. They really are understanding more the international relations context of doing business in a certain company. Um, so they, we've differentiated them that way as well in terms of core business functions that you would typically expect an MBA to have. That's in the international MBA. 
So in a way, it's similar to a master's in management, but with a very deep and profound international bent. Yes. And has yeah. the specializations. If you're in international finance, most of those faculty are top scholars in international finance. Right. The distinction is that it is not an MBA, the MIB. Yes, exactly. Um, and it is, as I pointed out earlier, a one year program versus the international MBA, which is a two, right. a two year program or 22 month program when you uh, take out the summertime. Um, and you have two tracks. And this is interesting to me as well because you have one where uh, there's a language requirement That's right. and one where there isn't. Explain the two tracks and, and the kinds of different people those tracks um, attract. Yeah, that's great. And we do call them language trackers or global trackers. I love that. And we really provided the opportunity for someone, if you're very target on, targeted on a certain region of the world, we can allow you to focus and study both on campus and then in country that language, as well as what it's like to live there. It's the nuance, not just learning to speak it, but how does that um, segment of the world, that population actually live every day? Um, we also pride ourselves on the fact that in your progression through an MBA program, think about if you're targeting a certain company and industry, let's say it's French, you are targeting Michelin, you are targeting L'Oreal, you may not know that coming in, but after your first year of the MBA program, you can choose to be a French tracker and go then study French and be abroad. And it sets our students apart when they're then applying and interviewing for those roles. So the language component is very dear to our heart and we love our language trackers. Global trackers, we tend to see, especially those going into consulting because they get a choice around the world. So you can think about the components of what your vertical is going to be where you're targeting there, or again, industry specific, and really choose locations that you think are gonna enhance your understanding. Um, Microsoft, for instance, has been attracted to global trackers who go study in Latin America. So we, we work every, and Doug can come in on this as well, we work very closely with industry partners to understand their needs, and then to make sure we've designed the program for both language and global locations around the world for students to study in. Right, so you through global locations, you have partnerships with other schools, or how do you do that? We do. We do. Yeah. So they're required to go abroad for two to three months. And mm -hmm. we have an extensive international partner list that we coordinate students both taking classes in their schools or their universities. And these are the top universities in the world. And as well, taking a class component on campus that's integrating both the international experience and then how to come back in comparative institutional systems, for instance, how does that compare to the US? If you're a manager in a multinational, but headquartered in the US, what's the context of what you just learned abroad? Yeah. Now, I think that your founders were incredibly courageous in creating an MBA that was hardly commoditized, that's truly unique and different. But I imagine that that makes Doug's job all the more difficult because placing students uh, who are from an unusual program that focuses so much on the global nature of business, while that's the way business is practiced, that's not traditionally the way companies may recruit. And I wonder, uh, Doug, how, from your perspective, how do you then approach the marketplace for your graduates? Sure. Um, it, well, in the end, it's still an MBA, right? And it's, yes. just, it's just a global landscape instead of just a simpler US landscape, right? right. Um, but we have a fairly structured program we call Career Leadership Program, CLP1 and CLP2 which is, again, fairly has the core tenets, resume building, LinkedIn bio, targets, company development, you know, the, the, the main tenets that you're gonna to do to find a job. With the international program, we just have a global landscape. So if it, rather than just looking at Houston, Dallas, and Austin, if you're gonna to go to Texas, we're looking at Paris, we're looking at London, we're looking at Singapore, if you're gonna go global. So the, the same underlying principles apply, just the landscape's larger. It's harder on the employer relations side. We're trying to build the network with the employers over there. And we try to leverage the US counterparts first, but in the end, it's the same process. Yep, yeah. And in, in terms of your most uh, recent graduating class, it may be too early to assess the class because they only just graduated. Uh, so maybe we might want to go back to the 
class of 2021. What did, what did the uh, outcomes look like? Well, we'd love to talk about 21. The, uh, we like 22 too, but so 21, we had a, a really buoyant job market coming off a, a pretty tough 20. Not a lot of companies had visibility in 20 with COVID. 21, recruiting came back. We had 100% placement, very strong, great companies, Microsoft, Amazon, Bank America, Nike. I mean, really straight, strong, great employers. Um, 22, we're tracking well. We're tracking really in line with where we were last year. Um, similar strong employers. Numbers are very much in line, and we're very we're feeling pretty good. Actually. That's terrific. Uh, I love to hear that. <laughs> well, you you touched on what earlier you, in the sense that don't. the southeast is growing, right? And so you've got yes. both individuals and companies coming to the southeast that want to be a part of this growth market, and it's not just. Florida that and get the profile, whether it's Texas, whether it be the Virginias, whether it be Nashville, Nashville's on fire, right? We've got Atlanta and Charlotte as our core market hubs, but anything around this entire Southeast corridor is our target market now. And we're, we're really feeling the, the wind behind our back. Yeah, I know that Apple and Google are and Facebook are, have been making big investments in the area and that's yep. a big uh, change as well. Uh, leading to tremendous amounts of growth. Now, Doug, from your perspective, I wonder what uh, employers appreciate most about your graduates. What would you say? Um, I had to put a finger point on it. It'd probably our business analytics strength. I mean, huh. there, there's, a, there's a premium today for uh, candidates that have a strong analytical background. A lot of your entry-level jobs are analysts, financial analysts, marketing analysts. There is business analytics is at the core of every one of our academic programs, whether you're in marketing, whether you're in market, uh, finance, strategy, uh, supply chain. And I think that our students have a, uh, a, 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 they deliver a day one ready quality. They go into the interviews highly prepared, really knowledgeable in terms of what, they, what, what job they want, why they want it, and why they're good at it. And then what they find, and we, we, we don't have a, the quantifiable metric other than graduates who come back to us a year or two saying, you know, when we went in, we were leagues ahead of our peer schools in terms of preparedness, particularly on the business analytics. Um, right. Two, the obvious one, the international depth and experience, right? The international flavor and depth of experience that they get from our curriculum, I, we believe is second to none. You know, let, you know, the language some people may get in other schools, but the immersion the international orientation of business and what and how they do it. Those are probably our two biggest, uh, I'd say, distinctions and expectations when, from a Darla Moore MBA. And your third party uh, validation of your emphasis in international business comes from U.S. News, where you've been the number one school in the U.S. in international business for how many years, Jennifer? Nine years in a row. There in you go. Top three for 32. Yeah, that's pretty remarkable. And it's a level of consistency that can assure anyone of, of the strength of the program and its uh, true emphasis on global business. Um, you know, one of my favorite questions, Jennifer, to ask is when I visit a campus and I sit down with students, I'll often ask, okay, give me three things that really mattered to you. What were the three hallmarks of your learning experience in the program? If I had the opportunity to go and have a drink with some of your students in a bar, what would they tell me, Jennifer? One of the first things they'll say is size and the ability to know everyone in their cohort, but not only that, know their faculty. And the fact that they can go down and sit and have a beer with every one of their core faculty members and the most elite specialization faculty, because we've kept that cohort small. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a that's a big one. That's a big one. And in fact, just give us your your annual intakes for the MIB and the international MBA, if you may. Sure. For the for the MIB program, and that's not a program I manage directly, um, but they are tied together with us in the IB department. Um, they're typically taking in thirty students directly from into our program and 30 students exchange over from our partners. We're running about 60 MIM, MIB students in our classes at one time. That's a good internet group and a very diverse one. Exactly. And then every year for the new IMBA class, we're taking in 30, we've capped at 30. And so we have about 60 international MBAs on campus during the year at any time. So again, 
Again, yeah. everybody's got to really know each other That's and right. know everything about each other, not just know your name, but right. know really truly who you are. That's right. Another thing we've had, and I just interviewed one of our alums who took a, a, a nice promotion at um, Facebook or Meta now. And she said, the one thing that I appreciate is you made me uncomfortable. We send you abroad and it is not a planned trip. This immersion is you are finding your housing after you've chosen your location, the school there helps set things up, but it is not the school planning where you're gonna go every day. It is you having to learn to live in that region of the world. And that will have our students raise their hand for those tough assignments at any future job they go to. So I think that's the second one they'd say. And then the third is the culture of caring. I mean, I think in the global environment, I'll say this, and I'm a, a native New Yorker, you feel it. You feel the inclusiveness in the school because every person you meet is a, has from a different background and we acknowledge and actually embrace that in everything we do. So those are the three I think, and they have said that I, that I get excited about sharing with people. You know, and I love the concept of support, but not handholding. Mm -hmm. um, because the truth is you learn so much when you have to navigate yourself through a foreign country, a different culture, uh, with a different language. And you can only appreciate the changes and the differences if you yourself have to undergo them. Uh, when you're handheld and guided with a Sherpa, it isn't really quite the same thing. You're, you're more of a tourist than you are a true participant in that culture. And so, so I, I love the fact you singled that out as one of the three hallmarks of the program. Is there a lot of experiential learning in your program? For sure. And I know Doug works closely with our centers. We're fortunate we have 12 major centers and all of them have practitioners or clinical faculty running them. So these are people that have risen to top positions and functions at major global 100 companies. And so our consulting projects that we run the companies are our clients. They get the advantage of the MBA talent early on, and the students get tagged with executives on major project projects. For instance, Coca-Cola launching a new brand in Latin America. So we'll partner with them, and they'll get to see firsthand what's going on. Yeah, that's that, that's what contributes to some of that go, day one go readiness, right? I mean, to yep. be able to have done two to three consulting projects by the time you finish your MBA. You know, and you've done marketing, you've done finance, you've done within these projects, it's right. second to none in many, many ways. Plus in your uh, IMBA, I'm imagining there is time for a summer internship as well, right? And, right. During, and what kind of internships are being offered to the students given the global nature of the program? Uh, it's cross the board. Again, it's done by academic focus. So you're either going after a finance one, a marketing one, a supply uh -huh. chain strategy. Um, but it's all walks of life. You could be uh, in, at Microsoft doing marketing. You could be with UPS and logistics and supply chain. You could be, um, I mean, they're, they're, we've got at SAS and Charlotte, all the banks, B of A, Wells, and um, uh, Truist, JP Morgan, all of you generally have roles within finance for our MBA. So it, pending your academic interest and, and professional aspiration, this is kind of the world's your oyster. You've got a lot of options, both locally, nationally, or overseas. And for those who don't know, I should point out, you know, Columbia, South Carolina is a fantastic dynamic town. The university is very much at the center of it. Uh, but you're not, you know, in some uh, long lost outpost far flung from everything else. Uh, it's a very cool place to be. Uh, and I know this because my daughter went uh, undergraduate school to uh, USC and had a great time there. Um, and I might, maybe you can talk a little bit, what is Columbia, South Carolina like for people who don't know? Sure, I'll, I'll take it first. Although Doug's the newer transplant here from up north. Um, it, it is a dynamic town and growing. I think we're really seeing some revitalization as well because the accessibility, Charlotte, Atlanta, North Carolina, Asheville is growing, Charleston, the port's expanding. And so with Columbia being the capital of the state, so all of the, the key political aspects of how the state's managed really plays into it. And I would, I, I would say part of the university's 
um, standing on international business is because the state of South Carolina embraced international business. There was a one-time statistic that we had the most international investments into South Carolina per capita than any other state in the country. Wow, I'm not sure after COVID if that's still the case, but for instance, I sit on the Columbia World Affairs Council where we're regular meeting with our sister cities and talking about exchanges and how to continue expanding international business. So the component of the city being international, feeling international in this southern, middle of a southern state um, is fantastic. And, you know, the, the pace of life is a little slower than New York, but you, you get used to it and enjoy it quickly when you're not always having to be on the go. But it really is a vibrant city. I, mean, New I, I moved here <laughs> from Chicago and worked in New York. And, and I tell you, I'm, I'm far from bored. I mean, you, you're an hour and a half to the beach, you're an hour to the mountains. You've got a great city, and I think we're the eighth or ninth largest, fastest growing city in the United States. And some great restaurants I can attest to as well. Really good restaurants. And grow, you wouldn't believe what's come to town since. Yeah. Uh, but interestingly, yeah. the mayor is working with three of our marketing students. He, the, the mayor, Daniel Rickman, is partners with Darius Rucker, and they have a liquor brand. They have a couple of bourbon brands. That's right. And he's, en he's en enlisted as three of our students with the head of our marketing center of excellence, and they're helping him launch their new bourbon brand very near term. So How about that? exciting. It's, 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 so we hear from the mayor firsthand that it's, it's a lot happening. That's great. Now, I'm imagining that some people might think, okay, because you only put uh, 30 IBMs out into the market each year, the network might not be as strong. The alumni network at the schools, but I'm thinking, wait a minute, you, the, those 30 people are so well bonded with each other and the school itself that I can't imagine a better way to instill loyalty, devotion, and allegiance to not only the school, but to its future generations of graduates. Uh, talk a little bit about this network and how tight-knit it is. Yeah, you, you, you hit it on the head right there with that experience with having to leave the country and the comforts here and go together abroad is life-changing and we'll have students come back. And in fact, we have an, uh, a reunion um, program where they'll come back 10, 15, 25 on campus. And as a lifelong higher education um, career person, to see this group together, it really is an affinity I have not seen anywhere else. I think we enjoy that maybe above other schools. I, I, can't, I can't state that factually, but to see this group that's so bonded and will follow each other and meet everywhere around the world because that's their passion as well, um, I think is very unique to us. In terms of the, the marketing of the program and the networking together, we do put a lot of work into it. In fact, my role is designed to have a large portion of it working side by side with alumni and development. So I'm going to all the alumni hub events. And as well, in, in terms of this, the stature of international business at the Moore School, remember we have an undergrad program as well that's number one in the country. Absolutely. So the IB really bonds everyone together. And I can call just as easily someone who's in a top role at a company with the IB undergrad and say, hey, I have an IMBA. Can I connect you? And that really gives us more strength as well. So your ideal student is someone who understands that the world of business has changed dramatically, that it is everything is international today. Um, whether you penetrate a different market than your own domestic market, whether you source products from other places, whether you're learning how to be a better business person and run a better business because you're learning from organizations all over the world, that's the person that you want in your classroom, right? Exactly. And then in the classroom, we teach you the nuances of, look at the percentage of businesses in Europe that are familial businesses. They're, they're owned by families. Yes. Unlike the U.S., that is very, very focused on public trading and right. public ownership. And that's what we'll bring in that's different in some of our classes and highly focused on versus um, some of the other general finance classes. But someone who wants to know all of those differences and nuances and is passionate about it. That's great.
So what's your advice for someone who's, you know, in consideration mode, thinking about an MBA program, uh, doing that early exploration, getting ready to apply uh, in this next admission season? What should they be thinking about right now? So the first is, and I'll, I'll pivot this to Doug, where do you want to go and what do you want to do? I think the exciting thing about this time is it really is that reset for your career. We can help you get there. But to get through the process, get the best scholarships, you really do want to think, am I a marketing person? Am I a finance person? And then reach out to us. We, we actually have a high acceptance rate because we pre-qualify well in advance. We, we don't like to get hundreds of applications. We really want a student focused on what we do because it's different than, than a general two-year program. So in, in immediately upon thinking about, is this the global piece I want? Come see us, come get in a classroom and talk to the students. I will give you alumni names so you can understand their whole progression through business school and if that is a fit for you. Great, Doug, your advice? Very similar. And, and again, I sit with Jennifer in a lot of the admissions so that we understand where the student wants to go I, yep. I think that we've seen our admissions uh, or our, our placement rate uh, go higher since I joined in 2018 because of my you know, 20 plus years of executive search consultant, I can understand a lot of backgrounds. I can connect a lot of dots. And as we're interviewing them for admission, we're already thinking of placement. We're trying to understand where they want to go. Do they have our core values as a student, as a professional, as, as whatever they're wanting to be and do? And does, it, does their career aspirations align with all of those values? And we're trying to meld those together at the very outset while we're interviewing them so that we can try and guarantee as much success as we can on the back end, not just the front end. Yeah, I like that because I think that schools that pay attention uh, from the very beginning on the career aspirations of their incoming students just have uh, a head start on making sure those aspirations are fulfilled and making sure you, you're graduating happy, happy students into right. the marketplace. Um, because when, when there's a disconnect between admissions and the career development aspect of what an MBA program should be, I think you're gonna res it's gonna result in more uh, uh, frustration and more dissatisfaction among the graduates. Yeah. Um, and, and do your alums come back to the school? Because I know that they probably, uh, you know, are in far-flung regions of the world and all that, given their jobs and their focus. Do they come back to the school? They do, absolutely. And I'm smiling because I have one, our orientation program at the end of the month. We feature our keynote speaker. We go out and we get an alum. We kind of showcases the progression through the program and the career that we think can also share a story to help our new students learn from. So I'm really excited about that. And they volunteer all the time. There is, um, I almost feel like I can't give them enough. So I'm really proud of the people that we have connected to the school as well that have the, the more School MBA. And as an SEC school, they're either a football fan or a basketball fan somewhere. <laughs> of course. Coming back for games, That's right? right. Game and let me, I will assure you that uh, anyone out there, if you attend a USC football game, which I have done, uh, you will be carried away by the incredible spirit and passion in the stands because you can feel it. It's palpable. It really is. Right. Jennifer, uh, how can anyone uh, reach you or a member of your team uh, to pursue more information about the program? That's right. It is at more, M-O-O-R-E dot S-C dot E-D-U. You'll see the MBA programs right on the front page. And as well, MBA at more dot S-C dot E-D-U gets directly to us. And the entire team reads those and can quickly help someone assess if this is a fit for them. Terrific. Jennifer and Doug, what a pleasure it's been to spend this time with you. I really appreciate it. I think we really got a lot of information in a short period of time and I hope everyone out there knows a lot more about the Moore School uh, and knows how differentiated and unique it is. So thank you very much for watching and thanks for participating. Thanks. This is John Byrne with Poets and Quants. Thanks, John. Bye. Thank you Bye. very much. Really a pleasure. Hope to meet you someday in person. You as Bye. well. Bye. Come on okay. to campus. Okay.